All right. Thank you all for joining us this evening. On behalf of my co-organizers for the Politics of the Prescription Pad Clinician Scholar Working Group, I'm delighted to welcome our first guest speaker of the year, Professor Travis Chiwing Lau. Dr. Lau is an assistant professor of English at Kenyon College, a published poet, and an artist whose oeuvre is a multimodal exploration of the intersections between literature, medicine, pain, and disability. Dr. Lau's first scholarly book, entitled Insecure Immunity, Inoculation and Anti-Vaccination in Britain, 1720 to 1898, explores the long history of later vac long history of inoculation insecurity and considers how inoculation practices from earlier variolation to later vaccination were politicized through ties to national identity as defined by national health and population security. His second book project explores historical models and theories of chronic pain in the 18th and 19th centuries, with a particular focus on the issue of pain's relationship to disability. In addition to his substantial contributions to the literary studies of medicine and disability, Dr. Lau has also published two collections of his poetry, which, feature, which explore embodiment at the intersections of queerness and disability. His first chapbook, entitled Pairing, is available through Finishing Line Press. His second chapbook, centering on the embodied experience of chronic pain and entitled Vagaries, is out just this month with Forktine Press. Some quick notes for our guests who are joining us on Zoom. Please mute your microphones, and for the Q&A section, please type your questions in the chat, and Dr. Page will read them aloud. Um, we've also placed a link to access copies in the chat for you to, uh, to read. For those of you who are, who are here with us in person, please note that we have some access copies available for you. Uh, just raise your hand if you'd like one, and we'll deliver it straight to you. I would also like to encourage our in-person guests to please wear a mask so that we can better protect each other in line with disability justice principles. And N95s are available on the table over there if you don't have your own. Kimberly Adams, William Page, and myself are thrilled to have the opportunity to learn from and engage with Dr. Lau's beautiful work, and I know that you all are as well. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lau for his lecture, Putting Disability Studies and Pain Studies in Dialogue. Hi, everyone. Oh, wow, okay, that is projecting. Um, thanks so much for coming on a Friday night. I know that there's so many other things people could be doing than thinking about disability and pain, uh, but I really appreciate the opportunity to think alongside you. So um, first, allow me to express my gratitude to Kim Adams, Sarah Williams, and William Page, um, and the Politics of the Prescription Pad Interdisciplinary Working Group for generously inviting me to Brown uh, to address you all today. I'm gonna try to do this. Do you mind if I read? Does anyone need an access copy? I might want to read on the physical copy if, some, if someone doesn't mind. Thanks. Appreciate it. Excellent. As someone at the very beginning of my career uh, and still trying to figure out what it means to navigate academia as a queer disabled scholar of color, I'm honored to be able to think out loud with you about methodology and what it really means to do interdisciplinary work. Because interdisciplinarity has so often become a vacant buzzword that usually becomes reducible to a plurality of voices, the idea that we're somehow interdisciplinary just because we have multiple disciplines sitting in the room. I have felt a, a lot of responsibility to think seriously about what it means to put disciplines into conversation, especially if they are in tension or if they ask different questions with different critical objects used to answer them. I want to be very clear that I do not claim to have solved this problem. Rather, I start from this contested place in all of its contradictions and challenges as the means by which I do ethical scholarly practice. But before I jump into my talk, I want to begin with my usual accessibility notes. I remain deeply committed to how disability studies scholar Tanya Tichkowski defines the concept of access as the, quote, interpretive relationship between bodies. My goal in this lecture, in my classroom, in my scholarship, in my mentoring, is to enable as many body minds to engage in that interpretive relationship and collective knowledge making as possible. Access is not a rote set of boxes we check off, nor a set of compliances that allow us to virtue signal some mythical, marketable sense of diversity. Rather, it is a shifting horizon of inclusion that constantly adapts to the needs of the specific body minds that share space together. <clears throat> 
This matters whether we are in Zoom, in the classroom, or in a lecture hall. The pandemic has only underscored how urgent access is to a sustainable future of the collective work we do in the academy. And I'm so grateful to be able to have this lecture in a hybrid modality, especially as we are navigating the worsening crises in higher education and trying to translate the very practices that constitute academic culture into alternative yet viable forms with deeply limited resources. To be very clear, we have been trying to do this now for going on two plus years and have been forced to confront the limits of such translation of what we do, idealistic as we may be in our expectations to simply quote unquote carry on or return to normal in the face of profound political, moral, and logistical emergencies. I begin with these accessibility notes because access is not optional. Whether you are attending this talk in person or virtually, I encourage you to inhabit the space you're in now. Stand, sit down, spread out, stem, step away, turn off your camera, and inhabit your body minds as fully as you need to during the course of this conversation. Alongside captioning, um, I have a full script of this talk available at the link on this slide, and it is in the Zoom chat if anyone wants to read along on their devices. Um, if there are other ways I can make this talk accessible to you, please let me know. Uh, and I look forward to engaging with you during the Q&A uh, Q discussion in the Zoom chat, in an email after the talk, or whichever way is most accessible to you. So how did I arrive at pain as an object of inquiry? My former dissertation chair recommended to me the scientific work of Thomas Beddoes and Humphrey Davy, who famously experimented in the 1790s on gases, especially nitrous oxide, or what we now know as laughing gas, at their pneumatic institute in Bristol. Mercilessly mocked as two quacks getting high and calling it science, they believed pneumatic therapy could be the way of intervening in life-threatening illnesses like consumption via the use of gases, both natural and chemically produced, to influence the body's state. In Davies' estimation, pain and pleasure were central to how sensibility was grounded in the nervous system. To that end, gases needed to be able to intervene in the imbalance of one over the other. Quote, nitrous oxide had the power to transform painful sensations to pleasurable ones by increasing the nervous energy within the body. But he, but he in this case, Davy, did not conceive of a way in which sensibility could be dissociated from the body without adversely affecting its living principles. For these reasons, his suggestion that nitrous oxide might serve a purpose during surgical operations should be read as a means of using its stimulant qualities to counter the depressive and painful ones of surgery as he had experienced during toothache and headache. Um, and that's a quotation um, from, um, I cannot remember her, fir her first name, but her last name is Snow. And it's this book, this brilliant book called Operations Without Pain. Um, despite its lampooning, the Pneumatic Institute radically experimented with the possibilities of medical intervention that alongside developments like Edward Jenner's discovery of vaccination at almost the exact same moment, politicized preventative medicine. With apothecaries, quack or otherwise, peddling salves and laudanum, the last decades of the 18th century saw a rise in the use of opiates. And as Roy Porter put it, it was, it was as if, quote, the very pain threshold of society was becoming lowered. However, it would take until eight, the 1840s for revolutions in surgical practice to abandon chloroform in favor of ether or nitrous oxide. This was not just a shift that had ramifications for surgery, which was generally becoming longer and slower, but also for the greater cultural signification of pain. Quote, the idea that pain could be avoided broke sharply from established understandings, which believed that pain performed a vital function within the body's systems. This is also Snow in her book, Op Operations Without Pain. So divesting pain of significance deviated substantially from established religious frameworks of pain as spiritual trial or pain as divine omen. Anesthesia bore the possibility of managing or even avoiding pain altogether, when for decades, pain had been the indicator of a body's vitality as it underwent surgery. So I'm left with these crucial questions. Had pain effectively become purposeless and therefore subject to chemical interventions even before the event of pain? If you can simply make it go away, does pain even matter anymore? As someone with scoliosis-related disabilities living with chronic pain, I found these questions unsettling, 
for how they speak so much to our current opioid crisis, or what we might describe as a greater cultural crisis about what pain means, whose pain gets to matter, and how pain is managed, if at all. Pain's ease of erasure has ironically caused us to misunderstand it that much more. The reductive binary of either the elimination or suspension of pain as our only responses to it urgently demands our rethinking, as this unsophisticated approach has led to lethal consequences. Those suffering from chronic pain frequently find themselves either ignored by medical professionals or over-medicated to the point of dependency. The logic is either imagine it's not there or make it go away. The very assumption of pain as suffering is, quote, behind the ethical imperative of ending pain, positioned particularly in terms of a need to end pain by whatever means necessary, end quote. And that is the uh, work of Emma Shepard, who I'll be re referencing a lot, uh, who is a scholar in the UK who's working on chronic pain. Disabled people have long been imagined as not only subhuman, but also entities constantly afflicted by and reduced to both psychic and somatic pain. Whether real or imagined, disabled pain has been cast as states of abjection that often exceed or destroys language's ability to represent them. Elaine Scarry, in her 1985 book, The Body in Pain, The Making and Unmaking of the World, was one of the earliest texts to propose the notion that pain was deeply antithetical to language and therefore unshareable. For autistic or other nonverbal neurodivergent people, their pain has often led even medical professionals to presume they are either entirely nonverbal or a-rhetorical because their pain, quote unquote, speaks for them. Quote, the positioning of the doctor as an all-knowing hero is in turn bound up with the assumption that pain is always experienced as suffering, that a chronically pained person exists in a state of constant suffering. And that's Emma Shepard again. Pain becomes so totalizing that the chronically pained person is flattened to pain itself and nothing more. They can only be understood in terms of their pain as only capable of hurting and contagiously spreading their discomfort to others who are forced to witness it. It is also, it is also always, it always becomes the fault of the person in pain. Quote, Normative discourses of pain place the blame for pain squarely on the shoulders of those in pain. But when pacing and other rehabilitation practices fail, the blame is placed not on rehabilitation or the ableist desire to cure disability and illness at all costs, but on the chronically pained and chronically fatigued person. Because of pain's invisibility, it so often provokes doubt, scrutiny, and ultimately stigma. Chronic pain, as understood within the medical model of disability, which frames disability as a problem, a lack, or an error, is a body-mind that has failed. The body in pain has failed to its ability to regulate. It's failed the mitigation of risk. It's failed the physical and moral expectations of health altogether. Disability studies and pain studies have thus rightly tried to emphasize that living with a disability does not necessarily entail pain, nor does pain necessarily have to be experienced as part of a disability or a disability in and of itself. While I want to be very clear that not all people in pain necessarily under understand themselves to be disabled, I think framing pain in terms of disability helps us expand the ways we think about pain beyond the biochemical processes that we can somehow isolate and fix. Joel Michael Reynolds' very recent bioethical and philosophical approach in his book, The Life Worth Living, Disability, Pain, and Morality, which came out in 2022, offers a disability-centered framework for revising the dominant ableist views of pain. I have found his concept of ableist conflation crystallizes the consequences of framing disability as a pain state of being and pain as only suffering. And I'm gonna walk through uh, how Reynolds uh, qualifies this particular term. Ableist conflation. I, this is Reynolds, offer the ableist conflation as a concept to capture the underlying presuppositions that guide ableist discourses and practices in philosophy, ethics, politics, medicine, local, national, international policy, and beyond. Although it can take many forms, the ableist conflation involves some variation of at least the following four claims. One, disability necessarily involves uh, a, lack, uh, a lack or deprivation of a natural good. Two, deprivation of a natural good is a harm. 
and three, harm causes, uh, harm causes or itself is a form of pain and suffering. And I realize on the slide I had missed that fourth one. Uh, it reads here, four, given one through three, disability comes along with or directly causes pain and suffering. For Reynolds, there is an ethical imperative to decouple disability and pain because their conflation has undergirded the ableist oppression of disabled people from their medicalization to their institutionalization to their eugenic elimination. Because Western intellectual traditions have assumed that human flourishing can only involve the general minimization of pain, disabled people in pain are presumed incapable of such flourishing. As Reynolds puts it, pain is, in turn, thought of as a sort of constraint or lack relative to potentials of purposiveness and flourishing. All such models of flourishing also assume that the corporeal variations we today categorize as disabilities are, on the whole, constraints or lacks relative to those potentials, whether defined in primarily physiological or psychological terms. This is the question I want to pose to you. What does it mean that we have established the parameters of human flourishing as something disabled people and people in pain can never access? Pain studies is embrace of more holistic understandings of pain that do not presume an easy division between physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual pain could be in much greater dialogue with disability studies' long-standing refusal of Cartesian dualism and advocacy for body minds as complex totalities. And just for clarity and for access, I want to explain why I'm referring to bodies not just as bodies and minds, but body mind as one word. Uh, this is a term I've taken from a disability scholar named Margaret Price, uh, who has been very deliberately trying to trouble the distinction between mind and body, such that it, it's actually it, there's a certain kind of politics suggested when we think about bodies and minds as a totality. And from a disability standpoint, Oftentimes, many of the people, myself included, experience disability on multiple registers that are not so easily distinguishable between body and mind. So actually, quoting Margaret Price now, Margaret Price, to whom this project is profoundly indebted, has called for a, quote, need to think and talk more carefully about pain, not in order to overcome it, but in order to overcome the many oppressions that attempt to annihilate us for feeling pain, end quote. This, to me, feels like a historical project, one that does justice to how those in pain in history have long talked about pain in more complex ways than we currently do. How have the progress narratives of scientific and medical innovation contributed to an ongoing cultural amnesia about pain's significance? My turn to 18th and 19th century literary, medical, and philosophical works attempts to move toward, toward what Alison Pat Savis calls a crepistemology of pain. Quote, it is my hope that crepistemologies materialize in ways that permit us to think pain otherwise, to produce painful new knowledge, but also to construct analyses about pain that are less painful and less dangerous to those of us in pain, and in doing so, to reimagine our shared pained futures. In my second book on chronic pain, which is very much in a nascent form, I found myself reconsidering how the very critical frameworks I even use and the historical fields that I intervene in remain deeply ableist. Even in studies of disability topics, we marginalize disabled lived experience and foreclose the possibility that pain has something to teach us in its own crip ways. I begin this project, this new project, then with a premise that I remain actually quite unsure about. Can we historicize pain in ways that can more compassionately and justly address pain's vicissitudes and chronicities toward better forms of care and interdependence? This has been the research question for me, um, and I'm actually very curious what you might think about this uh, in the Q&A. I use the word chronicity here very deliberately. What do we actually mean when we say chronic pain? What temporal models do we have for thinking about pain's durations? its management. When bouts or flare-ups of pain occur, the typical narrative is that we turn to pain relievers of increasing strength to mitigate those pains. But any pain not manageable by medication, pain that leads to excessive medication, or pain that persists despite medicine, all fall under the category of chronic. 
Chronic in these usages suggests interminability, unknowable duration, or perpetual ceaseless pain. As medical professionals have themselves begun to admit, the pathology of chronic pain is also a byproduct of biomedicine's own fetishizing of teleological narratives of curative resolution rather than palliative care. Alison Kafer has called this temporal framing curative time, which imagines illness and disability following a linear trajectory in which such conditions are expected to be ameliorated, cured, or even eliminated. Intrinsic to what disability scholars have called the medical model of disability, this enduring framework, and these are Kafer's words, not only expects and assumes intervention, but also cannot imagine or comprehend anything other than intervention, end quote. As a result, non-curative approaches like palliative care still remain outside this curative imaginary because they get framed as wastes of time and resources and without clear, and dare I say it, insurance billable outcomes. Disabled bodies in pain have always been understood to be, quote unquote, out of time, out of sync with time, deviations in the progress narrative toward cure. And those are Kafer's words. And by out of time, I'm referring both to a displacement from normative developmental timelines, but also in the eugenic sense that so many disabled people are seen as expendably out of time, out of time left to keep living, and in a eugenic sense, the they're expendably out of time, le time left to keep living, and in a eugenic sense that maybe therefore they should not. My project is interested in a crepistemology of chronic pain that accounts for its crip time. What Mary Lisa Johnson, to whom my own crip consciousness as someone living with scoliosis related disability is deeply indebted, has described of her own scoliosis as, quote, episodic, not linear, a matter of intensities, sensations, and situations. Crip time deliberately refuses the expectations of able-bodiedness and able-mindedness and the harmful fantasies of a pain-free existence to instead understand pain on its own idiosyncratic terms that might challenge our own limited vocabularies and force us to develop new painful languages that are in fact less, in fact, less hurtful. In her study of the lived experiences of chronically pained people, Emma Shepard emphasizes how much of these experiences revolved around attempts to return to able-body-minded time or the management of symptoms to maintain the semblance of normative, healthy temporality. Yet, from the uncertain period of diagnosis, or in some cases, non-diagnosis, to the recalibration of life to accommodate the asynchrony of pained life, crip time is pained time. The concept of crip time helps us observe and identify the absurdities of ableist timescales that actually punish people for failing to adhere to them or imagine a kind of mythical, hyper able-bodied uh, person capable of keeping pace. For many chronically pained people, developing new dynamic rhythms of life, what Shepard has called crip pacing, is always a vexed process of working through one's internalized ableism while also reorienting oneself to a crip life with new embodied demands and needs. Quote, pacing can be an ableist rejection of chronic pain and fatigue, but also a crip embracing of living with chronic pain and fatigue. This ambivalence, I think, is particularly apt for crip experience that is always torn between the challenges of living as disabled, but also celebrating it as identity and community. To return for a moment to Joel Reynolds' meditation on what constitutes human flourishing, I've been thinking a lot about what my colleague David Turner has described as a tendency in our field to focus on sensational representations and accounts of disability as suffering. While David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder have famously suggested that, quote, disability is the master trope of human disqualification, I've become increasingly invested in histories of disability that do not presume suffering as a prerequisite for disability experience or simply part of a teleological narrative of increasing pathologization and oppression with the rise of the statistical norm in the 19th century. Because disabled life is so often narrated as always already intertwined with oppression, disabled people are also misperceived as incapable of positive feelings or affects or experiences that do not necessitate their struggle with ableism. Take, for example, the presumption that disabled people are not capable of sex or sexuality. What are we to do with experiences of crip joy, pleasure, and flourishing 
though we do not yet have frameworks for, given the field's origins in a rights-based activist movement that rightly focuses on disabilities oppression. Sometimes the emphasis on pain and suffering elides these other experiences or circumscribes them as phenomena that is inseparable from suffering. To that end, disability scholarship has begun to take more seriously its activist origins and its deeper engagement with lived experience. Taking seriously the disability activist mantra, nothing about us without us, some scholars theorize explicitly from their standpoint as disabled people or attempt to recover an archive of disabled life, which is what I'm trying to do. To begin with disability as the very place of knowledge making and to recognize the vast range of embody-minded experiences as capable of knowledge making is the work of a term I used earlier, which is crepistemology. As Robert McCrewer and Mary Lisa Johnson have defined the term quite simply, crepistemology is, quote, thinking from the critical, social, and personal position of disability that both recovers the ways disability has been repeatedly neglected as bearing valuable experiences of knowledge making, as well as holds accountable how dominant ways of knowing are themselves ableist. I found particularly moving that crepistemology finds its origins in feminist standpoint theory, or what, or what Rosemary Garland Thompson has aptly termed sit point theory, that quote, particular, particularizes standpoint theory to disabled women by calling attention to the normative assumption that one perceives the world from a standing rather than a sitting position. It goes without saying that so much of recent crypt theory is indebted to both feminist and queer thinking. And sometimes I find the eagerness with which disability studies as a younger field wants to distinguish itself often forgets its historical affiliations and formative influences. But at the heart of these projects is an emphasis on disability as it, as itself inherently valuable, or as Rosemary Garland Thompson has since argued, an ethical, epistemic, and narrative resource worth conserving. Garland Thompson's deliberate use of the word conserve here attempts to do the semantic work of counter eugenics, as the term means literally to, quote, maintain a person or thing in continuous existence, to keep alive, existing, or flourishing, a word I've used before, to preserve something intact. And this term as well resonates with both architectural, historical, and ecological conservation. And this is Rosemary Garland Thompson's case for conserving disability. And this is where she explains why she uses the word conservation. And I'm gonna read it in its entirety because I feel like it really speaks to Reynolds' earlier point about what disability flourishing looks like. Quote, the idea of preserving intact, keeping alive, and even encouraging to flourish denoted by the word conserve, suggests that the characteristics, the ways of being in the world that we think of as disabilities would under such a definition be understood as benefits more than deficits. Furthermore, I, Garland Thompson, would distinguish the concept of conservation subtly from the concept of protection. Something in need of protection is understood as more vulnerable than something to be conserved. I intend the term conserve to suggest the prevalence, persistence, and enduring sturdiness of disability rather than its fragility or vulnerability. In other words, to make the case for conserving disability, I need to make a case for disability as a resource to be conserved rather than a liability to be protected. Garland Thompson pushes us to refuse the ableist impulse to jettison disability and pain as only undesirable states of being. What might these states offer us if we reinvested in these embody-minded experiences as part of the breadth of human biodiversity and as viable states that do not preclude flourishing. Addressing this bioethical question is, for Garland Thompson, the means of countering neo-eugenic discourses and technologies like CRISPR and prenatal testing that see disability as something to be screened out in advance or edited out entirely. Often framed as benevolent or even utopian for their capacity to reduce or prevent human suffering, gene editing technologies also dangerously imagine a future without disabled people in it at all. So what might this revaluation of pain and disability look like? I'd like to conclude here with the fairly new work of my dear colleague Emma Shepard, who has been, this might not have been a place that you would have expected my talk to go, uh, has been doing work on BDSM culture. 
um, and BDSM subcommunities and disabled people in disabled people in pain's active participation in these communities. In BDSM context, the unreliability of the body mind in pain is quote balanced out by participants through their kink, through their kinky play and kinky sex. Kink pain is reliably reliable in that it is predictable, even controllable. Within kink, pain is the inevitable consequence of chosen actions, end quote. Harkening back to Humphrey Davies' belief that pain and pleasure were the poles of human sensibility, BDSM collapses that binary deliberately as part of play. Pain is pleasure is pain is pleasure. The boundedness and deliberateness of kink play reframes pain's inconsistencies and arrhythmias into something containable within limits predetermined by those participating. The mutual care-based relations sustained in BDSM communities has helped many chronically pained people to redefine their relationships to their pain and the pain of others, while also enabling new forms of expression of that pain not immediately coded as disgusting or undesirable. Shepard makes clear that this is not reductively a case of internalized ableism, in which people living with pain are reclaiming some sort of normalcy through their rationalizing and systematizing of pain via kink. Rather, these communities are already framed as abnormal or deviant, and their identities as people living with chronic pain only facilitate their skepticism and deep antipathy toward compulsory heterosexuality or things like compulsory able-bodiedness as they are associated with being normal. So rather than submit to the labor of passing as normal, BDSM offers an affective and physical space for the experience of an expression of pain in all of its sensational registers. And this is Shepard again. Quote, kink pain is still pain, but it is something they can choose to experience and to which they can call a stop when they have had enough. For others, kink pain does not replace so much as overlay chronic pain. In its urgency and acute sensation, it pulls attention away from chronic pain. The re reshaping of context wherein acute pain is experienced in a controlled situation gives them control over pain and allows them to, and I love this way that Shepard phrases it, welcome sensation again. If we are seeking to imagine more inclusive futures that are indeed less painful for those already living intimately with pain, this work must begin on a social, cultural, and narrative level. As I've suggested in my other work on the ableist histories of anti-vaccination, if these problems were truly reducible to science alone, these would cease to be problems. I've devoted so much of my career as a scholar and as a poet trying to refute the fundamental assumptions that folks like Elaine Scarry proposed in The Body and Pain, that pain can't be shared and that it can't be rendered into language. In my experience, at least, chronically pained people have been the most effusive people in their attempts to explain and express their forms of pain. They have vibrant and thriving communities that are deeply interdependent. And I'll leave you with a question that I think has defined my career. Is it that pain really is antithetical to language or have we just been absolutely terrible at listening to people living with chronic pain who are reimagining the limited vocabulary and metaphors we have to talk about pain? It is very clear to me that pain has a language and it has a poetics. We have just been failing to pay attention at great individual and collective cost. Thanks everyone. Turning it on is a good first step. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, we're now going to open up for a brief Q&A session here in the room, um, and we'd like to start with the Zoom attendees. Um, if you could type your questions into the chat, and Will will read them out. Um, and then once we've uh, gotten through most of the questions, or if not all of them in the Zoom, um, we'll have a bit more discussion in here, and then we'll uh, exit into the hall where we have wine and some drinks and cheese and we figured we could have this is a good sized group for a more fulsome discussion all of us together perfect um, do you want me to stay up here for Q&A or would you like me to move there uh, will the camera be able to catch you well, the, I think the camera would certainly be able to catch you yeah wherever yeah. you're more comfortable 
Yeah, I figured I'd stay up here, but I wasn't sure if you wanted me to move elsewhere. Yeah. You're good there. Great. Well, what I might do, I'm still waiting for some Zoom questions to populate. Um, but so I'm a, I'm a practicing clinician mm -hmm. in, in the hospital nearby here. And uh, as an internal medicine doctor, I find myself frequently um, not curing problems, mm -hmm. meaning I think that uh, very often I find myself with uh, you know, telling people about uh, conditions that are, are going to be chronic. And I, you know, I do use that word quite frequently. Mm -hmm. um, pain or not, um, many of the conditions we are simply controlling as opposed to you know, actually curing. And I, I'm interested to hear your take on the um, sort of survivorship uh, as, a, as a reframing of the conversation about um, about ability and disability, because I, I, I've, I've found that even a lot of the diseases that we now talk about as being cured, often uh, there is a, a sort of associated um, set of traumas that um, lead to, for example, even a cured cancer having mm -hmm. years and years and years, a, a lifetime of down the line um, notions of sort of being a survivor. Um, and I, I guess I'm wondering how I could more effectively uh, discuss really any and all problems that somebody comes to me in the hospital with um, and sort of frame, frame that narrative of, of sort of chronicity or break down that notion of chronicity and, and sort of make it sort of, a, a, I guess, a smoother, uh, a smoother narrative between this notion of you know, disease mm. and ability. That's such a good question and one that I guess I have a few ways of answering this. The first is I'm thinking a lot about the sort of the language of survivorship, right? And uh, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about in relation to some of the older scholarship in narrative medicine, um, thinking about, um, I, his name is escaping me now, uh, Arthur Frank, who uh, wrote this book called The Wounded Storyteller, ref talks about experiences of chronic illness or um, a kind of long-standing disease, like say something like cancer, um, disrupts the narrative experience of one's own life. Um, and for Frank, what the process of healing is, is providing a restoration of that narrative out of wreckage. And narrative wreckage is the word that Frank uses. And I think about what it means for survivors to be in that place of wreckage. And my impulse as someone who works in disability studies is not to rush to that mending part of returning that person to this state of pre-disease in that, oh, we can somehow return ourselves to this idyll idyllic fantasy of ourself before we've ever had illness. I think as, as a clinician, you have this precarious role and really, really difficult job of sort of navigating this after effect of a person who is not just learning to survive, but understanding the narrative of them, themselves as profoundly different than it was in, in the wake of this particular illness. And I'm thinking about this in terms of my own family, many of whom um, have uh, underwent extremely long uh, experiences of chemotherapy. In many ways, they would probably be described as disabled, but when I talk to them, they are fiercely against that label. And that has a lot of cultural connotations, uh, a lot of political and ideological implications too. But I think f something I've noticed or realized about my work is I'm here to facilitate the narratives that they need to better, to sort of better move forward. And if that involves a sort of recasting of their life as a survivor, like that, who am I to deny them that? And I think this is partially what was related, partially related to what I was trying to get at the end of my, my remarks, which is I think instead of trying to come up with a, a sort of singular model or formula, how do we sort of better attend to those needs? And I think this is where narrative medicine is doing incredible work, right? Thinking about the act of medicine and the practice of medicine as a narrative act, right? I hope that addresses your question to some degree. Yes, I think it does. Thank you so much. Um, I have uh, quite, a few, uh, quite a few comments coming <laughs> in. So we got, we got, things, uh, got things moving here. Um, I'm gonna read them in order. Uh, so uh, I have, uh, the first question is, as we hopefully move away from the medical model of disability, how would you recommend finding disabled community and purposeful disabled joy while living through pain? Wow. Um, in many ways, and I don't mean this as a glib response, that is a question that I'm still navigating. Um, 
I, uh, I came really into what I would describe as disability consciousness in my early 20s, uh, and I'm still trying to figure out what that is. So my, my two ways of answering that is first, um, disability community is literally everywhere, uh, but it is often in places you don't expect. So for me, as much as it is currently a dumpster fire, Twitter has been a really incredible place. The amount of disability activism that I've witnessed, the amount of interde uh, interdependency and mutual aid that I've, I've witnessed happen on Twitter is truly incredible. Uh, but also, maybe this is me being selfish and thinking about this in terms of disability literature and culture. Um, right now feels like a golden age of disability lit. Uh, and I think about this, th this is maybe a little sentimental, but I feel like the forms of community that I found first were literary ones. Um, I guess I can, in this case, uh, put a plug for a book that just came out um, by the activist Alice Wong. Um, and uh, the year of, it's called The Year of the Tiger, uh, and it's this moving memoir, hybrid memoir um, about disabled experience, but very much about disabled joy. Uh, and I can't really describe it without sort of having the, the, the book in front of me, but it is so much about what it means to coexist with disability that can be immensely debilitating, but then taking deep joy in it. Um, so I would really, really recommend sort of turning to these forms of representation that don't frame disability only as suffering. I, I actually think that might lead us nicely into the next question. Uh, hi, Travis. Have you heard of graphic medicine mm -hmm. using graphic forms to encourage story and knowledge exchange? Yeah. How important are historical understandings of disability to present day living activists? Mm -hmm. activists with limited access to time and resources. So actually, it looks like a two for one. Yeah, and I'm going to see if I can do this in order. Um, so graphic medicine is one of the, in my mind, one of those great fields that's coming into the fore now that is pushing back against the ways in which, say, the health humanities and disability studies uh, as fields have tended to be very textual, right? So what do we, what, how do we turn to visual modalities to do storytelling? And for a while, I was hearing these kinds of elitist comments by uh, sort of big people in the field that say like, oh, comics is a sort of lesser form. And to me, that is a really dangerous way of approaching this question when our, our goal is to recover the forms of expression that uh, sick and disabled people are producing. So the, the fact that graphic medicine is intervening in this way feels urgent to me, especially as I think the, the, the development of, of graphic novels and sort of the graphic form has changed so much in the past decade. It feels like a missed opportunity if we're not attending to it sort of more closely, especially as so much of it has had to deal with uh, experiences of illness and disability. So many graphic narratives have come out. Um, so that's the first question. Let me see if I can answer the second question. Um, it's about history, I believe. Can you repeat that last one? Absolutely. And for, uh, forgive me, I didn't realize they were two separate questions until I was midway through. The second question is, how important are historical understandings of disability to present day living activists with limited access to time and resources? Mm. So, I'm going to admit my bias immediately because I'm a historian of medicine and I work in 18th and 19th century Brit Lit. But I'm going to try to answer this slightly differently um, in terms of my own formation as a gay man. Um, I remember when I first came out as gay in eight, when I was 18, um, I felt this weird sense of embarrassment, shame, um, and also a, a sense of urgency to learn about histories I was never given access to. Um, I was appalled that I, did, I had known nothing about the AIDS era and its consequences for my community. And I think that same urgency applies to disabled people. Some of the best activists I know are not just thinking about the present and future, but thinking about the past. Um, and this is where I find the work of historical disability studies so urgent and important, because it's very easy to think about disability as only a thing that matters once we get to the 20th century when disability becomes a politicized identity category. But disability has existed throughout time. And to neglect that, one, misses out on what the first question was asking about community, right? Where can we find community? We can find it in the past, too. Um, so these sorts of unexpected encounters, forms of solidarity in which we find disability in the archive, 
this kind of historical work for me is really important because, and I see this in both queer and disability communities, a sense of cultural amnesia, right? A sense that all that matters is when disability becomes that identity category that is protected under the ADA. But disability has been a contested category since its inception, right? So if we're not paying attention to those histories, however vex they are, we're missing an opportunity to do more rich um, organizing, if you want to think about it from an activist standpoint. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm going to read uh, a full, uh, a full uh, comment that does seem to have a, a question in the middle, so um, mm -hmm. let, me, let me go through here. Uh, comment more than question. I am also a disability studies scholar working on pain issues. I love your work and am so thrilled I found your talk today. The framing of finding supportive narratives in history is super interesting to me, given that I've been focused on how we dismantle dominant stigmatizing narratives of pain that underlie and propel pain prejudices, misunderstandings, etc. I believe that your work and this I believe that your work and this work is inextricably intertwined in terms of what history gets centralized and embedded in cultural sociopolitical concepts of truth, mm -hmm. what is, is not real, et cetera. I'm interested if you have thoughts on this. Mm. I think if I were to respond to this, I'm trying to think about why one of the big questions that people ask me all the time is, well, why history as opposed to the present? And I think methodologically, this is really telling in, in sort of my first book, which I'm trying to get done now, um, about anti-vaccination. I, I, I'm, as we look down the sort of barrel of the academy itself falling apart, I have very little patience now for history for history's sake in the sense that it is uh, sort of divorced from political investments in the present. Um, and this is partially my formation as a scholar in this present moment, right? I, I went to college in 2008. I went to graduate school from 2012 to 2018. I watched the academy in so many ways turn out to be so different than how I imagined it. So for me, the political stakes of what I do feels really urgent. If not, I, don't, I, I would not see myself doing them. And I think there's sort of a try to address this question more substantively. I remember what it was like to encounter disability in the 18th century for the first time. I've written about this a little bit, um, about this figure named William Hay, who was a parliamentarian, uh, but also uh, a, an incredible writer who wrote this um, incredible essay called On Deformity, uh, which was a, one of the first defenses of disability as something that made him a better man morally, spiritually, and ethically. And I remember encountering this and wondering, how is this an 18th century document? And I, I think the, the, the goal for me in sort of encountering, encountering these forms of disability in history is weirdly to find kinship. And I don't know if that sounds perverse or odd, but I think for so long I felt like I was dealing with disability alone um, as, as this thing that I had to do in private or in secret or under the auspices of my particular medical provider. But to, to find disability in history, one, shows me that th these conversations have predated me, and two, that there are unexpected forms of kinship in the archive that I just have not encountered yet. And that, that sense of solidarity uh, and intimacy with a figure who is centuries older than myself, I, I remember it being a really powerful experience. All right, the next question asks, what are your thoughts on administrative and accreditation requirements hmm. regarding asking about pain levels and clinical encounters? Oh, God. And I'll stop there. There's another question from the same person. I will be the first to admit I do not know nearly enough to offer a substantive answer, though the answer I will give is about the um, perversity of the pain scale. Um, there is a really, really brilliant essay by a writer named Eula Biss, uh, and I teach this all the time in my medical humanities class. Uh, essentially, Biss talks about how disturbing the pain scale is in which it sort of forces us to reduce our pain to these sort of knowable faces that are in some, in, in many ways, only approximations of what pain can be. And those numbers become sort of 
forms of access to certain forms of care. So is your pain severe enough? Is it an eight or a two? These kinds of value judgments, which only approximate pain, are one, really poor translations of what subjective experiences of pain are, and two, presume a kind of universal subject that feels pain the same way. Something that has been weighing really heavily on me is the sort of very, very uh, pervasive truth that race-based medicine makes it, makes it so that many folks of color, particularly black folks, who, uh, who are experiencing massive amounts of pain are ignored or seen as incapable of feeling pain. And that has a long history too, dating back to the 19th century on uh, some of the slavery debates. And I, I've been thinking a lot about how that filters in to the, even the administration of medicine now. Um, like I said, I don't feel like I have enough qualification to intervene in that particular way, but I'm thinking about these histories as shaping that particular um, administration, so to speak. Wonderful, and I actually think that question, uh, your response gets at part of the, uh, the second part of the comment here, so if that, um, if, uh, if, if Tiffany would like to uh, rephrase the, something, if you don't feel that has been addressed, so please let us know. But mm -hmm. um, I, I do, I think um, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, we also don't like those faces. <laughs> um, and, you know, the fact that somebody saying a six versus a five means they get an entirely different dose or an entirely different medication strikes me as thoroughly crazy. So. Um, next question is, what are some practices, models, or examples of historicizing pain? Mm. This is a really broad question. Um, and one that, so the broadness of that question actually says to me that there's so much to be done historically with pain that we need to be thinking about this across genre, across historical periods, and across conflicting definitions of pain. I was just at a conference in which uh, another colleague of mine uh, was telling me that she was working on sort of American accounts of pain in the early 18th century. And our archives are so different, right? She's working with these kinds of ephemeral journal pieces uh, that are, are deeply, deeply subjective um, and deeply narrative in form. And I have another colleague of mine who's working on visual culture. And I think this kind of gets us back to that question of interdisciplinarity, right? That the, the only way that we can sort of do this work of historicizing pain is to, is to in, encounter it and engage with it on its own terms. This, is, this has been an interesting debate that I see where I've had people say to me, for instance, um, that it's anachronistic to look for pain in the archive. And my usual response is, but scholars have been doing this for a really long time, especially I'm thinking about any field that is minoritized, thinking about uh, folks who are looking for race in the archive or queerness in the archive. I think it's not so much this kind of um, anachronism for anachronism's sake, but thinking about how these presentist uh, stakes actually help us look more closely and more specifically at a historical record that is incomplete, right? So I, I, I have problems with this reductive belief that just because you're looking for a particular identity category in history, it's just anachronism. Um, this is something that um, some of my colleagues in the 19th century uh, who are part of this group called uh, the V21 Collective have been talking about as their term is the strate a strategic presentism, right? A, present, a presentism that is deliberate, that situates the past as a way of intervening in the present. And I think that's where anachronism can be useful if done carefully and with purpose. As it stands now, there are two questions left, and then I'm gonna go a little out of order, but I think it's because uh, this, this one's a little more definitional, and I think the next one's a, a little bit broader for, or for me. Um, uh, thank you for presentation. Could you further explain pain has a poetics, in quotes, pain has a poetics, mm. or give an example? It's funny that this question gets posed because um, the running joke in the disability community, I'm currently editing an anthology of disability poetry, and the running joke is anytime, anyone, uh, anytime anyone says, what is your definition of disability poetics? Everyone goes, I have no idea. And this is not, this is not a, a, a sort of glib response. I think something that is really interesting about this current moment in disability literature is that 
poetics has often been seen as a thing that does not include disability, or the sort of history of poetry and poetics has not involved a robust engagement with disability. So a lot of the poets in my generation now are sort of inventing that language and thinking through what poetry can offer to disability, or if you want to think about disability as a poetics itself, its forms, its contours, its resonances. I, I, I wrote, I tried to write about this in an essay uh, for a journal called A Modern, um, and it's entitled The Crypt Poetics of Pain. And I tried to gesture to some of the things that I, I, I understood pain to be doing. Pain for me, rather than the Elaine scary model of pain can't be shared, it has no language, I kept thinking about how pain actually shapes my capacity to put things into language. So a lot of my poetry, for instance, um, my line breaks are actually not based on meaning or thought, but based on the moments when pain enters the scene of writing. So you'll see me put a line breaks at seemingly odd points, but that for me is a working through pain, beside pain, um, that isn't sort of driven by meaning, but driven by sort of embodied sensation. So I'm thinking here about how, if we were to argue for disability or pain as a poetics, I'm interested here in how it affects form. Um, and how the, the content or meaning that we receive is shaped by disability itself, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that. I, I realize that sounds a little bit vague. Um, but this is all to say that I think the, the sort of definitional work of disability poetics is happening right now. Wonderful. What a, what a time to be engaged. Um, so uh, I would like to echo the initial sentiment from uh, what seems to be the last question here on Zoom. Um, hi, I found this talk really rich and inspiring. Um, question is, I was wondering how, as a disabled scholar, you come up against the expectation to embody Rosemary Garland Thompson's super mm -hmm. and render your pain useful and productive for academic purposes. And I, I think if I, if I may, um, if I may just um, say, it sounds like there's a lot of inspiration that uh, people have been finding. And you know, I think we're all grateful that you're here. Thank you. I really appreciate that. In, in some ways, this last question has some of the greatest ethical ramifications for me. I Just to clarify what that question was getting at, this idea of the super crip is a kind of uh, figure in disability culture. Um, that is the ways in which disability is only framed as something that one overcomes or that you must be an inspiration for it. So we've all seen those commercials, right? Um, it's, it's some sort of, uh, uh, they're trying to sell some sort of product or it's an inspirational poster and it shows a disabled person in a wheelchair getting out of their wheelchair and walking. And this kind of language of overcoming suggests that disability is something that you simply get over and that all your sole function in life is to overcome it because your real potential is in all the other ways that you compensate for your disability. And I actually find this question to be really provocative in the ways that it situates me as a scholar as also sometimes participating in this, this troubling representation of, of disabled people as having to make their disability useful or it's not, a, it's not a good representation of disability. And I thought a lot about that, right? But I, I will say this. I, I tell my students and my colleagues this all the time. If ableism had its way, I wouldn't be here, right? I wouldn't be participating in the academy at all. Graduate school, the academy at large, are deeply inaccessible places. So I think my, my way of sort of reconciling this role I have as participating in what can sometimes be a kind of super crip in which I am um, translating my experience into knowable and acceptable forms is that if, if I don't do this work, if colleagues of mine don't do this work, we are ceding the academy to these deeply inaccessible forms of working. Uh, and I, I have students ask me, well, why would anyone want to do this if it is so hostile to disabled people? I think that overwhelming sentiment has barred the door for disabled people. But if we believe in any possibility for change, right, we have to have faith that our participation in it can, can lead to some sort of larger change. Um, and maybe that is a, a kind of bizarrely, for me at least, optimistic way of thinking about the academy. Um, but I, I think a lot about why I do what I do. And if I didn't believe in the fundamental possibility of a more inclusive future, why waste time, right?
Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you for everybody on Zoom. We are actually, what we're going to do now is we're going to open up the floor to any questions we have here in the room. Um, if, if, if more questions uh, come in on Zoom, we will also be monitoring, but I'll also be walking around a bit, so I might not uh, get to it immediately. But um, is there anybody here who wants to share a comment or a question? I can ask a question while people's thoughts are percolating. Um, so I really loved your ruminations on crip time mm -hmm. um, and especially the relationship between making space for crip time and also as a necessary precondition to valuing disability. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me think a lot about the relationships between like the assumed universal body yeah. in labor uh -huh. and working culture. Yes. Um, and of course, you know, capitalist time as the antithesis of crypt time. And I wondered if you could speak on that a little bit. Yeah. So the the funny thing is there's a joke in, in disability studies that crypt time as it appears in the academy only typically means to people that you just get extra time for things. Like, oh instead of starting at seven, we're gonna start at seven fifteen. But what that says to me is that there is a sort of gross oversimplification of what Crip Time's actual um, sort of imperative is, which is, and these are Allison Kafer's words, and Allison's sort of the person I go to when I think about Crip Time stuff. Allison says in, in her book, uh, Feminist Queer Crip, that Crip Time is normative time exploded, right? So it's, a, it's actually a deeply um, transformative model of time that says, the, the ways in which linear normative time works is that it assumes that a singular body, this sort of mythical body of perfect ability, is always productive and always capable of working. And fittingly, from a 19th century historical perspective, disability comes into focus as a category because of industrialization, right? To be disabled meant your capacity to work, and in this case, not work. Right? So if we think about disability in relation to this much longer history of capitalist labor, right, it's precisely because disabled bodies are not conforming to the, the timeline of industrialization that is always about perfecting and maximizing productivity um, that crypt time, I think, is, is such a reflection of that, a, a refusal of the demands of a kind of capitalist work that um, not only harms the bodies that are, are part of it, but also is a fiction, right? That in some ways, how are we expected as living beings to always be in this sort of perpetual productivity? And I think that's that for me is why crypt time is so useful um, as, a, as a way of thinking about how time can actually have a lot of cruel ideological demands on us. Thank you. I would just say, I, I, I imagine you saw there was an article a few days ago in the New York Times uh, with the with a somewhat provocative title, These Doctors Admit They Don't Want Patients with Disabilities. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I will say, just hearing you talk about time, and you know, my, my time is usually pretty well maximized and as efficient as possible, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I think I'm very fortunate to be working in a hospital environment where we actually are largely better at um, addressing some of these issues, although certainly not not optimal. Um, and I just, you know, I'm, I I don't know if I have much of a, a much more to share than that. But I do think that this article was was uh, opened my eyes a little bit. Um, was apparently performed by one of the uh, by somebody who came through this program too. So. Oh wow! I mean, I I'm aware that in over the course of my talk that. I, I represent medicine quite negatively, but for me, actually, these kinds of conversations have resonated a lot with med students who are in my classroom who are horrified at the inaccessible quality of medical education and what medical work demands, right? Um, the fact that I, I, I know so many medical students and residents who admit that they have to do a, sort of obscene things in order to maintain the work pace that they're put through. Um, the, you know, the, the sort of j uh, open secret of, uh, of substance abuse as a way of sort of coping through it and thinking about the, the, the mental well-being, uh, mental health of professionals, particularly during the pandemic. These to me seem to be larger questions that disability studies is posing that I think medicine 
for rightful reasons have been skeptical of, but actually can benefit from if we're sort of integrating these conversations into medicine, not just sort of in a humanistic way. There's also this sort of artificial divide that like disabled people are over there and medical professionals are over here. Like as though the assumption is that medical professionals are not disabled, cannot yes. be disabled. Or, and if they are, they should not be practicing medicine, which is the other sort of horrifying thing that I think about. Any questions in the audience here? Yeah. Hi, Travis. I'm Nicole. I'm actually a med one of the medical students here um, at Brown. Um, sort of to go off of what everyone has been saying, um, I wanted to ask, um, as someone who um, works as a part of like the national um, organization medical students yeah. um, with disability and chronic illness, uh, one thing that I have noticed, like both in my medical, medical education um, and in those experiences, has been that while I have observed an increasing um, effort to try to create spaces of care and community um, uh, within the disability, dis disabled and chronically um, ill identifying um, uh, trainee community um, and physician community, um, it always reverts back to um, sort of conflicts surrounding um, simultaneously being um, existing as um, with that identity of like a trainee or a physician and be remaining legible to like the institution while uh, performing uh, those acts of care. And I feel like uh, the need to, for example, um, uh, perform those acts in with a sense of politeness um, yeah. uh, and uh, sort of balancing that with the desire to do no harm mm -hmm. uh, to patients. Um, it has created a lot of tensions and I just wondered um, sort of where you might think that balance exists between mm. those aspects and um, yeah, how, whether it, whether such identities can coexist with one another. First of all, um, thanks for the work that you do um, and the community building that you do. Like that's where the, these forms of social change happen. My instinct here is to think a little bit about um, a term that now gets used kind of irreverently um, and without precision, which is emotional labor. So I'm thinking about its uh, sort of early incarnation uh, in the work of Arlie Hochschild, who essentially theorized uh, emotional labor through the work of flight attendants, right? That they need to do their job with a certain kind of emotional register that suggests that they are both welcoming, kind, and sort of fully invested in their job. And I think about how um, your work in sort of caregiving is predicated on that, right? Good care also involves a kind of emotional labor that is simultaneously an expectation but not acknowledged. Right. I was thinking about how some med students, and including a colleague of mine who just became a resident, how the, the sort of work that they do to make patients feel seen or heard doesn't actually factor in to a lot of the ways that they are appraised and the ways in which medical hierarchy sort of suggests that certain people are more predisposed to doing the touchy-feely work of, of emotion, while others are, quote unquote, doing more uh, sort of rigorous medicine. And, I'm thinking here about this weird relationship between emotional labor and the people who are most often asked to do this work and those who feel like they do not have to do it at all. And I'm thinking about how urgently your kind of community building is, first of all, challenging hierarchies in medicine, but two, suggesting that that care work doesn't just happen with people who are uh, coming in for care, but that care work has to happen within medicine itself. And it is disturbing to me, and maybe this is my own experience navigating traumatic experiences within medicine, that care work sometimes gets weaponized as a way of denying support and care for the people who need it most. The fact that, um, for instance, I've heard uh, I, um, my, my colleague who just became a resident is working sort of unspeakable hours, and when he refused, the, the system that he works for says, but don't you care about your patients? 
in this case, care is being weaponized as a way of forcing more labor. That's, in my mind, such a great example of where disability studies is intervening in these questions. This is a crip time problem um, and an accessibility problem. Uh, and I think organizations like your own, this is where this possibility for change can happen. So if I know that maybe wasn't a satisfying answer, but it's a belief in the work that you do. Hi there. Uh, Hi. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you. Um, I, so I also work at a hospital yeah. uh, close to here. And you know, one thing I often find myself doing is uh, talking to people who are transitioning into disability and yes. sometimes more optimistically out of disability. Right. Although that's less rare in the inpatient setting. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, you know, do you have any thoughts as to how to approach talking to people who are, so for example, a realistic example is a, a patient who has recently had a stroke. Yes. Who is now dealing with this and, you know, maybe isn't, it, it's difficult because some people, you know, aren't, don't want to label themselves as disabled, as you as you pointed out. Um, and yet sometimes that can be also a barrier to mm -hmm. accepting some of the care that, at least in the medical literature, would be recommended, things like rehab and things like this. Absolutely. Um, do you have any thoughts as to how one might approach that in a, a productive manner? Personally, I had this exact issue um, with a friend of mine who uh, was diagnosed with MS. Uh, and my instinct was, oh my goodness, I can share the wealth of resources that disability studies and disability activism has offered, and she rejected it outright. And it made me think about a few things. One is, how do we frame these conversations that do not reinforce this idea that disability is a kind of failure, or that disability is a, a sort of unbearable life to be lived afterwards? So I was thinking a lot about that point Reynolds makes about flourishing. There is really no justification for this belief that disabled people can't live very full and complete lives. And I think one of the things that maybe is a sort of artifact of an older moment in disability studies, um, at one point there was a, a, a kind of vogue for referring to disabled people, uh, referring to people in general as temporarily able-bodied, which is a brilliant way of thinking about this because I can, without having to sort of verify this point, that we will all experience disability and illness to some degree in our lives. So when we frame it, not to say that we should sort of universalize it to diminish the subjective experiences of those people who have acute conditions or long-standing chronic conditions that other people might not have, but thinking about the trajectory of one's life is always, always already going to encounter disability, I feel like is a really powerful way to change that conversation. Rather than say for my friend who said, I mean, she asked the question that many of us ask when we experience something like illness or disability, why me? What am I going to become now? I think that question doesn't necessarily have to be a negative one, but a beautifully positive one. What can you become? If we're all in states of becoming, be it able-bodied or disabled, why can, why can that becoming not be positive and beautiful? And I know that's perversely a, like a really optimistic and poetic way of, of framing that question. Um, but I've been, I'm really thinking about what the resistance is to disability, right? In this case, it's fear. It's also internalized um, ableism, where people who fear disability often have seen the ways in which disabled people have been mistreated, right? So that, that's a real reaction. And I think validating it is the way to go first rather than sort of seeing it as like a failure or a loss for that person. But I, I, I have such respect for the work that you do because I can only imagine navigating that conversation day in and day out. It's a lot of emotional labor actually, to use that word. I would argue that everybody experiences disability if they're lucky. Uh, <laughs> the only true. alternative I can think of is sudden death. Yes. So. Um, anybody else here with a question? There is one more on Zoom. Um, well, uh, so uh, from Zoom, I have, is there any movement to move away from the word disability? Uh -huh. It seems to suggest some kind of flaw just by the nature of the word. Mm. So this is very contested uh, territory. Um, so I'm going to actually defer to uh, my colleagues who are disability activists. 
Uh, for a long time, disability was sort of coded negatively, uh, and there was a, uh, a movement to um, what I think folks in the community would see as euphemistically trying to get around that problem. So thinking of things like temporarily able-bodied uh, or um, using words that, uh, using people first language versus identity first language. So what I mean by that is when you refer to yourself as I'm disabled, you're using identity first. But if you're saying a person with disabilities, that's person first language. And um, it, if you ask many people in the disability community, person first language often is a, a sort of euphemistic way of getting around thinking about disability as a politicized identity category. So a lot of people feel very strongly that in order to claim disability as an identity worth preserving, protecting, um, and that has rights, we need to stand by that term of identification. So a lot of people have sort of claimed disability as an identity. Uh, but it is, I think what it comes down to is individual identification. I have many friends who say, please don't call me disabled. Some people want to be referred to as crippled, for instance. And that is a term of reclamation, just like many other minoritized communities have. I'm thinking here of the word queer, for instance, uh, which is a reclamation of a slur um, to a sort of politicized identity category. So I think this is a, this is a long way of saying this particular semantic debate has been going on for a really long time. But this generation of, of disabled activists has been really invested in holding disability as a term of pride and identity that does not need to be disavowed and not seen as a failure or a lack or a negative term. In fact, how can we recast that in terms of what we've been talking about thus far as a, as a subject a subjectivity of joy and pleasure? Thank you. Um, Dr. DeFila, the Chief of Geriatrics and Extended Care at the Veteran Healthcare System here in Rhode Island. Um, so as you can imagine, I'm a geriatrician and I practice internal medicine. And so, you know, one of the things that um, came out of this talk is, is some things like, um, I just want to get a sense of what you think about things that came to my, my brain when mm -hmm. you were talking was uh, competition. Mm. Being vulnerable. There is a race. Someone will win, others will lose. Mm -hmm. um, equity. Mm. We're a huge world, right? And there's so many differences. And then we're aging, right? And aging for some people is a burden for society. They mm -hmm. see it as a, as a burden. Uh, and I deal with a lot of, as you can imagine, uh, persons with disability, just to go around the political. <laughs> um, but at the end of things, I enjoy my work so much because um, they're looking for quality of life. Yes. Yeah. And that's different from every person you talk to, mm -hmm. quality of life. Mm -hmm. With pain, without pain. Some people, you know, you have a 95-year-old with pain, and they will say, how is your quality of life? Excellent. Mm -hmm. I love my life. So it's something that, and then the fact that we stigmatize everything. And so with the stigma, and I think that's why some people like to call it persons with, persons with, yeah, mm -hmm. to try to avoid the stigma, you know, person with persistent pain instead of, oh, that's the patient with chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, or that's the patient, the dementia patient in, in room 35. Uh, it causes pain too. It's a lot of pain in that. So I just want to get your opinion about those things and how language can help us be more humane. Is that a word for that? No. How yeah. we can become more inclusive, I think you said, right? Like, yeah. But at the same time, knowing that we're competitive. <laughs> yes. My instinct is to answer with literature and with history. Um, so I'm thinking about a work of, of cultural criticism that was written in, in I believe, 85. Um, this is Susan Sontag's Illness as Metaphor. Um, it is one of those sort of iconic pieces of cultural criticism that um, was written as a polemic, right? So Sontag says, the healthiest way of being ill is one that is completely devoid of metaphor. 
And literally in the first two pages of it, she uses metaphor, right? And one of the ways, one of the things that Sontag grapples with is that in order to talk about illness and disability, we inevitably turn to metaphor. But one of the metaphors that she takes very seriously is what is referred to as the military metaphor. Um, so the idea that we talk about um, diseases, uh, especially chronic diseases like cancer, in terms of war, right? Uh, we fight, we, we do the fight against cancer, the war against whatever, whatever condition, um, that uh, when someone uses a particular form of treatment, that that person's body becomes a kind of battleground. And this, this really punitive and violent language of militarism um, really suggests that there are winners and losers. And I was thinking about this in terms of your point about it being a race. And the, the point here that so I've gained so much from Sontag is not that we should somehow talk about illness and disability without metaphor. Like, that's actually impossible. But think about language as essential for care. Right? So I've heard many, um, many practitioners of medicine say, it doesn't really matter what, what I call it, it just is what it is. And what you've suggested to me is that there are entire communities of people who are seeking a quality of life. And for them, that quality of life is actually bound up, to an, bound up with an identity and how they talk about their experience. And I, I began my, my responses in Q&A um, about Arthur Frank's notion of narrative wreckage. Right? If we think about each person each sick and disabled person's narrative has, as experiencing a kind of wreckage, it is the work of care to begin to shift that language of self into something new. And I can only imagine working with, uh, with elderly people, how much they have to work through this earlier part of their life and what they think about themselves and reorient themselves to this newer life of being older, and being dependent on others in a Western culture that fetishizes independence and individuality rather than mutuality and support, right? So I think how we talk about this, why we talk about this is really urgent. And I, I think it can be so easy to say, oh, I need to work on all of the sort of biological things that improve quality of life. Language actually is one of those crucial things that gets dropped out of that conversation. Thank you so much, all of you, for your insightful and generative questions. Thank and you. thank you, Dr. Lau, for your fantastic discussion and responses. Um, we're going to go ahead and draw the Zoom to a close. Um, so thank you, all of you, that joined us virtually today. It was wonderful to be able to share your comments and questions. Um, and for those of you who are in person, uh, we have, like I mentioned earlier, we have food and drinks in the hallway. and. Depending on what the deal is with the party outside, <laughs> the weather is so beautiful it that is. if there's space, it might be nice to just sort of head on outside to continue chatting and, and discussing. Yes. So please join us, me, in thanking Dr. Lau for, for coming today. Thanks, you folks. <laughs>